last week talked about Pastor Mike came and, and dealt with this question of Jesus. Um, I never knew it was a question of who do we say Jesus is. Yeah. And so this is a question that will be lingering throughout the series around, you know, who do you, who do I say that Jesus is? And this is a question that somewhat is formed within community, but somewhat is formed within our personal experiences, within how we encounter Jesus, how we are open to God teaching us about God. Amen? Amen. So this morning we're going to continue along this vein as we talk about um, the radical character of Jesus. All right? The radical character of Jesus. Um, those of you who have your Bibles, if you have the church Bible, we'll turn to Mark chapter 4, but the scripture will also appear on the screen in just a moment. I don't want you to get scared about how long the passage will be this morning. I promise it will not be a reflection of how long I'm going to preach. Mark chapter 4, starting at verse 35, and we'll read into chapter 5. In your church Bibles, is page 816. Page 816. Verse 35, chapter 4, of the Gospel according to Mark. Mark is usually a briefer kind of writer. He usually writes very briefly. You know, it's very clear and to the point. And it just so happens that this passage, he's a little longer. So I think there's something to be said about that. Chapter 4, the verse 35 reads as follows from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat. So the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebu rebuked the wind and the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm, and he said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this? that even the winds and the sea obey him. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of Gerasenes, your Bible may see, say, or uh, gatherings. And then, and when he had stepped out of the boat, immediately a man out of the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. He lived among the tombs, and no one could restrain him anymore, even with a chain. For he had often been restrained with shackles and chains, but the chains were wrenched apart, and the shackles he broke in pieces, and no one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always howling and bruising himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and bowed down before him. What? And he shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he has said to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. He begged him earnestly not to send him out of the country. Now there on the hillside, a great herd of swine were feeding, and the unclean spirit begged him, send us into the swine, let us enter them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the swine, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea, and were drowned in the sea. The swine herds ran off and told it in the city and in the country. When people came to see what it was that had happened, they came to see Jesus. They came to Jesus and saw the demon act sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, the very man who had had the legion, and they were afraid. Those who had seen what had happened to the demoniac and the swine reported it. Then they began to beg Jesus to leave their neighborhood. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed by demons begged him that he might be with them. But Jesus refused and said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and what mercy he has shown you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed. The word of God for us, the people of God, and we say thanks to the God. Thanks to God. And the radical character of Jesus, let's bow for a word of prayer. God, we know that we come into this place for 
various reasons and from various places, experiences. Many of us are in different places in our mind and our heart. But no matter where we are, we are all created by you and you know us fully. And so we're asking now that anything that may hinder or block the pure, unadulterated word that you desire for any of us to hear, God, that you remove that, help us to press past it, that we may hear your voice, be obedient to it, and respond. May we transcend the places where we are in order to be transformed by you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One of my mentors once taught me that being radical or invoking radical change in this world, in the space where you are, has more to do with your character than it does your behavior. I can recall asking him how it was that he was so successful at, at bringing forth progressive and radical change in the places where he were, where it was. And, change that really made a difference in the lives and the systems uh, that he was operating in. And he says, you know, Donna, he says, the reason it's about your character, he says, is because if you're secure enough in who you are and who God made you to be, he says, then you can get anything in this world done yeah. as long as you don't need credit for it. Yeah. He says, so I spent about 50% of my time convincing the people in authority that my ideas are theirs. Yeah. And the other 50% of the time, making my ideas work on the ground. Now, the public eye will see that when the results come forth, and they will get, you know, the authorities above him always get the credit for being innovative and progressive. But it always astounded me that it seemed to me that the people who were impacted on the ground by the change that he was um, bringing forth always knew when his hands were on it. And so what we have here is this understanding that when we think about radical, this kind of extreme kind of word, we often think about, you know, something rises and we have to counter it or, you know, this outrageous kind of behavior. Um, but I would like to present to you today this idea that Jesus wasn't just radical in overt ways, which we do see in the scripture, but there was something about the character of Jesus. Yeah. There was something yeah. Yeah. about the way he interacted every day yeah. with people and operated in this world that was at its core radical. Yeah. Yeah. And that we ourselves, if we are to be radical people, or even more so peculiar people in this world that is often dying, for we are called to proclaim life, then we too must find a way to make sure that we don't present radical, quote unquote, behavior yeah. during seasons of our life. Yeah. But that we adopt a way of living and interacting with this world that is at its core inherently radical. That's good. Yeah. In fact, two of the definitions that um, surprise me of what radical is are about to appear. Existing inherently in a thing or a person and going to the root or origin, fundamental. Now I want you to think about what you may know about Jesus or may not know about Jesus, but if you have some time to, to read the different accounts of what happened and what Jesus did, you know that Jesus was always going to the root of something. Yeah. Right? Let's give the service. We to get right to the heart of something. All right, so we're going to explore this today. And I would, I would also like to propose to you that in our accounts today, we see that, that the character of Jesus is radical because it's done in more subtle or humble ways, right? Because when we, again, we think radical, we think big and bold and really outrageous, right? But to, to have a character in, in this daily life, there's some ways in which I believe Jesus operates in this passage, and we'll look at a couple more definitions, that I believe by the decisions that he makes can affirm for us that, that Jesus' character was inherently radical. So the passage today, Jesus has been teaching, and he has been healing, and the crowds have gathered. And these are people who want to be around you, yeah. right? People who come to Jesus. And Jesus says to his disciples, come, let's get in the boat. We're going to the other side. So they get into the boat. Jesus falls asleep. And I don't know how many of you know much about the Sea of Galilee, but it is uh, surrounded by um, a range of mountains. And so storms can rise very quickly. And I know it. And some historians even say that waves, um, when a windstorm rises on the Sea of Galilee, waves it sometimes reach up to 10 feet tall. Okay, so we don't know how tall these waves are, but they must be pretty tall because three of these men are fishermen and they scared. Yeah. 
Right? I would be scared. Teacher. Waves are rising, Teacher. Jesus is asleep, and Teacher. the boat is flooded, and they do exactly what I would do. Hey, Jesus! Oh. <laughs> Why are you still asleep? <laughs> Don't you care? We're gonna die over here. Come on, man. <laughs> Jesus gets up. Probably Rick Rogers, like, really? Okay. <laughs> Peace be still. Mm. Right? And he calms the winds and the waves. And he turns to his disciples and he says to them, he says, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? Now I'm reading this and I'm thinking, you know, that's a pretty harsh question because I'm like, I would be scared out of my mind. If Jesus is asleep on the boat, there are 10 foot waves. And I have never seen this man interact with nature before. Right? <laughs> I don't know Jesus. And you know, I know who Jesus says he is, but I've never seen Jesus calm the winds and waves. <laughs> but I hear lurking in Jesus' question, the question that we were asking last week of, when he says, have you still no faith? Mm. He was asking, what do you know about me? What do you believe about me? And has it still not enough to make you believe mm. in who I am? Yeah. And what is their reply? They are all struck. It's the right reply. And what question do they ask? Who is this? Mm. And even the we in the wind. Yeah. 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 They finally reach their destination. They plant themselves on the shore of the country of Gattis, um, Gerasenes. And before Jesus can barely step out of the boat, he sees a semblance of his image running towards him. I can imagine this man's hair is matted and dirty and stuck to his head. His body is slim and thin because if you chained up, how do you get access to food mm. in the tombs? And, his body, a collage of colors, you know, of blood that is both dried and fresh because he has been beating and brutalizing himself in his flesh. And Jesus has said to him immediately, come out of this man, unclean spirit. He comes, he stumbles and falls at the feet of Jesus. And he says, Jesus, son of the most high God, what have you to do with me? I implore you, do not torment me. Jesus says to him, what's your name? So my name is Legion. But we have been. So Legion was comprised of, the Roman Legion was soldiers. It was comprised of maybe three to 6,000 soldiers in the Roman army. Teacher. This is proposed to be how many demons yeah. Yeah. were existing in God's just man. And they say, look, don't send us out of the country. Will you send us into the swine, these pigs that are on the side of the hill, and Jesus grants their request about 2,000, and as soon as the demons enter these pigs, you can see the vengeance and the uh, the violence that was inside this man reenacted in these pigs as they drive themselves down the hill and into the water. Now, there were people who were hurting these swines who were witnessing this. Now, I want you to just imagine for just a moment that you were one of those people. What would be going through your mind? What would you be thinking? Right? So I'm like, they got to be looking at the water, they're looking at Jesus, they're looking at this man, and they're backing up real slow. They start running into town. And y'all know how news spread. This unbelievable story about, you know, this man who's all of a sudden sane, and, you know, the pigs are dead, and this is how they make their money. Right? So he brings hers and people to the side of the shore, and they spy this man that they know has been locked up and nobody could contain in the tombs, and he is cleaned up. Jesus has given him new clothes, and he is sitting in his right hand mind at the feet of Jesus. Yes. Come on. Come on. So they see this, and they have a response that no one else in the Bible has to a miracle that Jesus performs. They are not awed or amazed, they are afraid. Yeah. Strange response. Yeah. And so what do they say to Jesus? Who, what do they say to the Son of God? They say, your name is Jesus, you ain't welcome. Yeah. Please leave. Please. You need to go. We don't want you here. Jesus does not open his mouth. He does not argue with them. He simply turns and he begins to retrace his steps to the boat. This man who's been healed is now desperate. He's like, whoa, Jesus. Y'all don't know what he did for me. Look at me.
preach, preacher. <laughs> Jesus had granted the request of the demons to go into the swine. He granted the request of these people to leave, but now his newest disciple, who he has radically changed, he says no to. Mm. Yeah. He says no. Yeah. Yeah. You can't go with me. Yeah. So I want you to go back into town and I want you to tell your friends. Yeah. Whether or not um, water boils. 
water boils, then that means the difference between whether something we are trying to sterilize has harmful bacteria that is killed, right? One second can mean the difference between a gold medal and a silver medal. Come on. You know, one inch can mean the difference between a gunshot wound between life and death. One matters. Yeah. So much so that Jesus was willing to go to the extreme lengths that he went to to get to this one man. However, it still seems like there's something missing from that. And I think the missing part is based upon the second very interesting decision that Jesus made in this passage. And that's based upon this definition, favoring drastic political, economic, or social reforms. Rather, favoring drastic political, economic, or social reforms. I found it very strange that Jesus would travel all this way, save this man, and then not allow him to leave the space where people had mistreated him. Why would he tell him no? I don't understand. I remember reading a biography about this young middle class Indian man who was um, struggling to fit into his culture and his society. And those of you who don't know much about India, India has what, what we call a caste system. And so there are, depending on where you're, who you're born to, your family and um, your place in society, determines your place in society, so they're caste, the higher all the way down to the lowest when you're very domestic and based work. And so he, you know, came somewhere up in the upper middle spaces of that because his father was an administrative official. And he was expected to follow in his father's steps, but he was awkward. He wasn't really good at school. He was small. He was shy. He didn't, you know, feel like he was really good at anything. But still, there were these dictates um, on him from culture and from the outside to, to be a certain way and to do a certain thing. His family sends him off to law school in London at age 19. He goes to law school, he comes back to India, and still can't fit in. He gets a job in South Africa as a civil rights lawyer, and he moves. And while he's there, he operates as he would in India as an upper middle class person, and he's on his way to defend a case on a train, and he buys a first class ticket. He sits down, and there's a European passenger there that complains about his presence. He is asked to move. He refuses and he is kicked off the train. And then all of a sudden, he has an experience that is foreign to him. He has been treated in a way that he's never been treated before. And it sparks some change in him. During this time, both Indians and South um, Africans in this space were being oppressed very harshly by others who were coming to the country. And so he began to fight for civil rights under this understanding, but he was digging deep because he couldn't understand why people could not see him as a human. He began to process this. He grew up as a Hindu, but he began to study other religions, and he became a strong advocate for the ways of Jesus. Russia, at the time, was having a very strong nonviolent movement led by Catholic priests. He became involved with nonviolence and the teachings of nonviolence, the teachings and the practices of Jesus, and he begins to change the way he lives and thinks and breathes. He will not send his kids to um, European schools. He homeschools them. He lives a very simple life. They begin to do base things. He begins to even break down the dehumanizing parts of his own culture in India. He denies the caste system. He teaches his children about hard work and about living very simply. And then after 20 years in South Africa, it is time for him to go home. But he is radically changed. He's not the same person. But when he gets there, this change, this radical change in one person sparks a movement that moves other people to change, that breaks for political, economic, and social change in India under British rule that was oppressing the people in their own home. Gandhi, even after his assassination decades later, is still influencing yes. change. Yes. Even though one degree can determine whether or not water boils, it doesn't matter if the other 31 degrees aren't there. Ah. One person can influence change in a space, but it takes many to actually impact. Yes. Yes. Could it be, I just want you to consider, could it be that by asking this man to stay among his oppressors, because if we're honest with ourselves, whether this man was demon-possessed
than not, most of our struggles and the things that we deal with often come from outside pressures. Not always, but often, right? It's hereditary, it is culture or environmental, right? It is systemic, right? And these people promoted his oppression. They chained him up. A person in need of help was, was pretty much punished for that, okay? So this is the reality of this man who's having to go back into this community with people who have caused him more pain. Could it be that Jesus was saying in his radical nature, your presence will break forth political yeah. Yeah. economic yeah. Well, we know human life. We're all humans and we live. Amen. Right? This man is radically changed. That means that he has to re-enter a system, Amen. a political system, that had laws that were not against him being chained as a human to the tomb. Amen. Something in that system was broken. Oh, yeah. But now because he is radically changed, that same yes, law that allowed him to be chained and to let him go. Yeah. yeah. to that law. Yes. Yes. Political yeah. Yeah. reform. Yes. Jesus automatically attacks their economical issues. Oh. Right? He snuffs their economical <laughs> growth by allowing these swine to die. <laughs> because he's saying your priorities are in the wrong place. You're what? Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. They're already having to see this man. And every time they see him, they have to remember that their swine died, but it's directly connected to how changed yes. this man is. Economic reform. And he's re-entering a space where he is interacting with men, women, boys, and girls who saw him before. Right, yeah. right, 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 right. Yes. right. He has to tell his story, and people have to process that in light of their own experiences. They cannot deny that he was changed to those two. They can no longer deny that this man is really changed. Social reform. There's some very radical things happening in very subtle ways just in two that Jesus thinks. Amen. Two. You see, when we are changed, we often want to leave. Hmm. Yeah. Right? Come on. Because it's hard to stay in a place. Amen. You don't want people reminding you of who you used to be. Amen. Come on. Amen. After you change. Yep. But the truth of the matter is the power and the strength of your change is lost on anybody who didn't know you before. Restoration, yeah. healing, and life connected to it. Oh, yeah. 
So much so that that same Jesus modeled for us the way he wanted us to, to be and behave. Yes. What does it mean to live your life in this way? Every day. We are practicing baptism today. This is a very powerful practice in the life of the church. We are not the only tradition who baptizes. But I guarantee you, it's the only tradition where you're going to meet the spirit in the water. Lost and 
how we truly feel and truly are and how we truly exist so that our whole life just becomes a mask, a covering. But Jesus is saying he doesn't want that shield up when you're interacting with him. Yes, yes. Just break it down for just a moment. Just one moment. Break that shield down. And lay it all before God. Lay it all before God. 